Ready for that? Sorry for that. Okay, um, so welcome to today's workshop. Um, I hope uh, now I can be heard properly. And uh, so I'm gonna be speaking about middle childhood uh, so, as a, you've been introduced. My name is Dominic and uh, I'm very happy to, to have you all here. And we are going to be speaking about middle childhood. And in case you want to write to me or contact me, those are my contacts that uh, you know uh, will be there also at the very end. You can speak with me uh, if you want to. So um, middle childhood. So middle childhood is that stage of age seven to puberty. So uh, I think most most of the children that uh, you know the parents have here, most of your kids are in that in that age gap. And I think some of you have already been in one of my workshops before, uh, maybe because maybe you have another child there at uh, Camelville. So from age seven to puberty. And the reason I'm saying age seven to puberty is because puberty is very unpredictable. Uh -huh. It's very, very unpredictable because it keeps changing, all right? And uh, especially for girls, it changes a lot. And some of, the, some of the reasons that puberty shifts for girls, you know, earlier and earlier, we call it precocious puberty. Precocious puberty is when, you know, starts way earlier than maybe 11 years, 12 years there. Sometimes we have it starting around the age of seven and sometimes even earlier. Uh, when in very rare you know, situations. So the biggest culprit usually is uh, food, nutrition, how much calorie, calories the, 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 the girl is taking or the, you know, the children are taking. Second culprit for early puberty usually is stress. So early childhood is strongly related to, to, to you know, uh, beginning of puberty, that is uh, the menstrual cycle. Uh, so that is, that is something that's to be aware of and also further, further presence or absence. And so around this age, the brain reaches uh, the adult size, okay? And I'm talking about the brain reaching adult size. I'm not, and I'm not talking about the brain maturing, the mind maturing. I'm talking about the hardware reaches adult size, but the software, the software is still to go. Huh? So the software, the mind takes 24 to 25 years to finish growing. So... Uh, the reason I like telling this to parents, especially about the development of the brain. And by the way, I am taking you through a psychology crash course, huh? saying that the, am I audible? Someone is saying I'm not uh, clear. Can I be heard? Am I, am I, am I heard kindly? If someone can let me know if my audio is not clear so that I can try to see if I can shift. We can hear you. Okay, great. If you can hear, thank you for that. Um, Biketi says you can hear me. Great. Um, if there's a problem, let me know so that I can adjust that I don't go. Okay, thank you so much. So two people are saying they can hear me. I'm clear. Great. So I, I will assume. So kindly check on your end, therefore. So anyway, coming back to this. What, I, what I'm saying is I'm taking you through a crash course, you know. So this, this usually I take the, my students maybe three hours when I'm teaching them developmental psychology, but I am taking the, the, the most simple ideas and I want to take you through this crash course so that at the end, you can have a bit of a background the developmental psychology of your child, and then you can incorporate your own um, parenting skills or parenting ideas to, uh, with that knowledge in mind. So the first thing that I want you to understand is the brain, the software, we call it the mind, okay? The brain is the hardware. The mind is the software. The brain reaches adult size around this age of seven, eight years. However, however, the software, the mind takes 24 to 25 years to finish growing. And that, is, and that, that means there's a lot of that is happening and there's a lot that your children cannot yet process. Huh? So that is something that is very, very important to understand. Okay, so exercise therefore is very, very essential. There are two things that are very, very essential for children, especially at this age, and one of them is exercise. Why? Because exercise helps to ensure the brain which is developing and the mind which is developing is very, very well you know, oxygenated. There's enough oxygen, okay? And children need to move. All of us need to move, but children particularly because of the undeveloped uh, mind, they need to move more. And that should not be negotiable as far as I can tell. Okay, number two is sleep. Okay, and I'll be mentioning. So let's start with, with exercise. So exercise leads to higher levels of satisfaction, you know, with family and the quality of life in children. So it's very, very important. 
And a child cannot say, no, mom or dad, I, I don't know how to exercise. You can run, you can move, okay? So that's essential. And that's why children play, they play. In fact, there is a huge, uh, there, there is a huge area within psychology called play therapy, where therapies use play to help children overcome stress. Mm -hmm. There is art therapy, there is play therapy. Play therapy is very, very important for children. So allow children to play. Yes, it can be, sometimes it can be too much. Maybe you've been working the whole day about, but they need it, especially yeah, what we call a rough and tumble play, which usually children often prefer, <clears throat> prefer to play with dads. You know, those, those games that are more dangerous, those, those games that make uh, mothers want to, you know, beat up their husbands for, you know, throwing up their children. Those games are very, very important, okay? So improved physical and emotional development. Uh, so that's also very important and better academic performance. So there are many other um, positive effects of exercise, uh, but these are some of the best, you know? And even for us adults, remember the brain, on, you know, the, the, the heart only pumps out blood, okay? It does not pull blood, okay? And so when you sit for a long time, the blood that is on your feet, you know, below your waist, you know, actually it's the stomach and below, that, that blood, you know, has to be pulled back to the heart to be pumped into the lungs. It is, it is not the heart that pulls it back from the legs. It is the muscles that, pull, that push it up. And so if you're not exercising, even as an adult, even if you're not exercising, you start having, you know, lower back pain, you start having leg problems because there's a lot of deoxygenated blood, okay? So it's very, very important to move and ensure your muscles are strong. Okay, so now look at this, look at this. Huh? What you can see here is uh, what you would call the, the, the amount of sleep required, the amount of sleep required across all ages. Huh? The amount of sleep required. And uh, I want you to see where your child, how much sleep your child is supposed to, to have. So the deep blue is the recommended, okay? The light blue is appropriate, maybe appropriate. Not enough, but maybe appropriate. The other color, let's call it pink for now, or brown, or something like that, uh, is not recommended. Now, when you look at this, your children, so maybe they are the preschool age, you know, um, three to five years, or maybe some of them already at the school age. But you can see there, that they are not supposed to, you know, the best hours for three to five years is 10. Minimum eight, minimum. And we're talking about maybe appropriate eight, not more than 14. Again, too much sleep is not healthy. Huh? Uh, so again, seven to eight hours is the minimum, bare minimum, nine to 11 hours. And the best sleep is continuous. You know, some people, some people ask me, is it okay? Maybe I sleep a few three hours, then I, you know, some three hours there. You know, the best sleep is continuous sleep. As much as you can, the best sleep is continuous sleep. All right. Um, so, therefore, um, it is very, very important to see here and to note. And usually, my usually my biggest concern is the teenage years when there are a, lot, a lot of psychological changes are happening. Our children are in high school. And most of our high schools don't even allow them to have the bare minimum amount of sleep. You know? So what happens when uh, children or people don't sleep sufficiently? These are the results, sleepiness. Now, when I tell a lot of people, especially my clients that they need to sleep, they tell me, but I'm not sleepy during the day. Okay, sleepiness is just one of the effects. You may not have it, but you may have other things. So daytime impairments. So a lot of daydreaming, you know, poor attention, Okay, poor attention. So you can see a child who does not sleep properly, they're going to have poor attention in school. And poor attention will mean maybe they will not remember a lot of stuff that has been taught. And that means they will not, they will not pass their exams. And maybe that means they will even be told not to sleep. They, you know, you're just sleeping a lot. You're sleeping eight hours. They're, they're children, they need eight, eight hours. So usually we might punish them for the, you know, for scenes that are not theirs really. So then there is poor memory. So lack of sleep is associated with poor memory. Mm -hmm. And then number four, very, very important, stress, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, which starts so early you cannot believe it. And as you can see what is in brackets here, children who do not sleep enough have three times more 
levels of suicidal ideation than those who sleep enough. Okay? I want to emphasize that. Sleep is so important that you can survive longer without food than without sleep. I'm going to repeat that. You can survive longer without food than without sleep. Right? And children need it. Huh? They need it so much. As you can see here, so some of our children, especially when I go to high schools, when I go to high schools where I, students are allowed to uh, allowed just to live maybe five to six hours, I, I, I listen to from the girls, especially higher levels of suicidal thoughts than those schools that, you know, girls sleep in. You know? And, you know, uh, girls more than boys have higher levels of uh, anxiety and depression at very, very high levels. So poor judgment and decision making. So risky behaviors, risky behaviors have been associated with poor, poor sleep across all ages, by the way, across all ages. People who don't sleep, allow me to say stupid decisions, okay? Uh, lack of motivation. So there's no motivation to study. There's no motivation to work. Then there's poor self-control, huh? you know, connected with uh, risky behaviors and morning tiredness, and of course, obesity and its complication. So lack of sleep, when you sleep enough, you produce a certain hormone called leptin. Leptin is the one that tells your brain you have eaten enough. You can stop now, okay? When you do not sleep enough, this particular hormone called leptin is not produced. And so you keep eating and eating and eating. So your appetite usually increases. And you, that, is, that results to obesity and all that because it's complication, okay? Now, um, so if you have any question, kindly feel free to ask at the, at the, at the chat section. So now I want to speak about self-fulfilling prophecy, self-fulfilling prophecy. And here, this is when, when you tell a person, when you maybe you tell a person, can you, can you ride the bicycle? And they tell you simply quickly, no, right? And, and when you give them the bicycle, they fall, okay? So what that means is they have already told themselves in the mind that they cannot ride the bicycle and they will fall, they'll fail because of that. Same thing, you hear a lot of children who might, who might say this, I'm not saying it is entirely wrong, and they might say, I'm bad in math, or I'm bad in this, okay? And when the exam comes out, they tell you, look, you see, I failed. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so you want to be careful about the things that children tell themselves that could be negative, negative uh, conversation. Even in ourselves, we have it. Eh? We have it. Oh, my boss will not understand me. Oh, my husband will not. You know, you have already, and then it happens in uh, real life. And then you say, see, I told you it would happen. Huh? Self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, uh, and self-fulfilling prophecy is strongly connected with what you tell your children. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where um, you are trying to do something huh? and you remember, you can hear the voice of your mom or dad in your head, okay? Uh, that's what a life script. Sometimes what our parents have told us can become part of our thinking. So maybe in one moment you told you, you, told, you called your child stupid. Huh? Uh, you told your child you're not you're not as good, you know. No. Those things they start these children start to internalize, and the more they internalize them, the more they become part of their thinking pattern. And when they become part of their thinking pattern, the wrong life scripts can be, can pull them down. You know, I know when I sit down sometimes to listen to teenagers for counseling, you know, they can tell you when I was seven, you know, my dad told me this. When I was seven, my, when I was eight, my, my mom told, and they are now 14, 15. I still remember this statement one day that my dad told me, okay? And, and how it's impacting them, you know? So, so good. Now here I would also want to speak about, about autism, autism spectrum disorder. So um, it's very, very, it's increasingly common, especially among boys. And especially the more we have uh, cigarette smoke uh, around. So, so cigarette smoke, so mother smoking is also a, a huge culprit for autism or she being around third party smoke uh, when she was pregnant. Uh, so it, and uh, so children, with it, uh, they, they have very poor eye contact. They have very, very poor social skills. They don't know how to understand that another person is angry 
or upset, you know, they have challenges with that. And uh, usually the, the earlier you recognize that your child have autism, the better for you, okay? So that you're able to start the processes that can be helped for them. They can be taught how to uh, learn social skills, okay? They can learn how to have normal conversation. So it can result in a lack of interest in learning language, okay? And, and reading social cues. So children with autism, even when you are angry at them, they don't know you're angry. And they can be very, very annoying because for you, you're saying, can, you know, I'm so angry, your face is showing. Usually uh, gen people can understand when a face is angry, you can tell Dominic is angry, Dominic is smiling, but children with autism don't know that. They cannot read that. You know, it doesn't seem, we don't know how that is possible, you know, for us, but for the yeah, children with autism cannot read that. So you just want to be careful that you don't end punishing someone who has biological, you know, challenges. Huh? Okay, so I'm not going to too many details, but if you have observed some of these things, you might want to see to the, you know, with a child therapist or clinical psychologist and see what that means. And here, I would also want to speak about three learning disabilities, three learning disabilities. One is dyslexia. So dyslexia is a, a problem with reading. Sorry, there's supposed to be an S there, dyslexia. Uh, uh, it's a problem with reading. Uh, being able to distinguish voices uh, or sounds of words, okay, uh, children who have a problem with this, you tell them to say on, they say no, or they tell you tell them to read no, they say on, you know, so they have really serious reading difficulty, okay, uh, they cannot associate words with their sounds, ah, but, you know, they have really serious difficulties associating words with the, with the sounds, okay, so that's some, something else. Okay, so children may reverse letters or have difficulty reading from left to, to right or may have problems setting letters with sounds. Okay, and it is neurological. Neurological means it's part of the, there's a problem with the software. Huh? This graph here, on the other hand, is a problem with writing. Okay, children have a huge problem with writing. They try writing and they have a horrible, not only a horrible handwriting, but they really have difficulty simply writing. Okay. Uh, just, just just writing letters, uh, designing letters as they're supposed to be, they have huge problems. Not one occasional letter, by the way, not just one occasional letter. Maybe sometimes you find children who, instead of writing B, they write D, you know. Uh, so not, one, not those one particular letters, no. It is like overall problems with, with, with writing. And then the, this calculia is, as you can see, calculate, uh, math, math, okay? So they have a huge problem with in learning math. Huh? So uh, if you if you find these and it's sustained across time, then you want to pay attention and maybe uh, sit down with a psychologist together with your child and find out whether this is particularly the case. So what I want you to do is just to observe maybe whether you have seen some of these signs and see if you can, how you can uh, uh, maybe now sit with a psychologist to see whether your child can be guided better. You know, our instinct as parents is to assume, no, my child cannot have a disorder, okay? But that's not a very good idea. Uh, uh, you know, we want to protect our children, but sometimes if they have disorders, then accepting and maybe starting the process of healing early will be the best way uh, to, to deal with the issue, okay? Now, another very common uh, uh, developmental disability, which sometimes translates also to a learning disability, which also affects boys more than girls, is what we call ADHD, okay? Uh, attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And uh, it's also neurological, that's, that is it's part of the software. And what you'll have here is these kind of children, and I say especially boys, I'm not talking, I'm not saying only boys, I'm saying most of them will be boys, is they have a difficulty concentrating, staying in task. They are easily distracted, you know, they will speak out of turn, they will, you know, they will speak, they will, um, you know, move from one stage to another, you know, they can't concentrate on one particular, thing. it's very, very difficult for them. Uh, again, it's neurological, and uh, it, it includes, can include medication, okay, stimulants, or, and, but better still, structuring the classroom uh, environment to reduce the distraction tutoring and parent edu education. So here, again, I want you to understand something that's very important. Children with ADHD have a problem with the behavioral control, which is rooted in their, in the, in their, in the soft brain. So the more you shout at them, the more you beat them, the more you, they don't know what is happening because it is, 
It is not that they are naughty, okay? It's that their brain does not know how to settle down, okay? So beating for a, ch a child for, for that is really beating a child or punishing a child for a scene that's not their own, okay? It's not their fault that they cannot focus for long periods of time. So uh, as you can see here, there are several brain structures that may be implicated in attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Okay, so uh, there's a bit of controversy about medicating, but the best way is, uh, uh, is, is assess to your child. Okay, now moving on. Uh, so I would want to mention about learning and intelligence quickly. Uh, the reason I want to mention this is we live in times where children or most of us are only measured or only thought as intelligent across a small, a very small domain of intelligence. Okay, or uh, so today we understand that uh, intelligence could uh, it's not theory of multiple intelligences, but theory of multiple intelligence. Okay that intelligence may express itself in nine ways. And the reason I want to say this is because sometimes your child may not express himself or herself within an intelligence that is you know, seen in school, okay, or uh, tested in school, but that does not mean they're not, they are, they are not intelligent by, by that fact. So what we are saying here is, they are like you can see here, there are several intelligences, the first three, is logical mathematical and logical mathematical are those children who are very good with with numbers you know what uh, uh, children they're very good in numbers uh logic then there's linguistic language okay they're good in spoken language in writing mm -hmm. spatial okay they're, they're very good in art they, they're they're good artists they can imagine you know? They can imagine stories, so they can write very good in shot because they can imagine stories in their in their mind. But also, they maybe they are good artists because they can imagine a situation. There are some of us who who have very very low spatial intelligence. If I told you close your eyes and imagine yourself uh, in a forest or imagine yourself on the beach, it's very very difficult for you to imagine. Your brain that has very low spatial intelligence, you have very low. You can't you can't simply close your eyes and start imagining those places because that's not how your brain works. Uh -huh. But there are some of us who you just tell them to imagine, they close their eyes and imagine it's, it's very vivid. It's like a dream. But some of us do not have it. And so are children. Okay. So IQ tests and most academic tests measure these three kinds of intelligences. But there are six more. There are children who are very good with musical intelligence. Mm -hmm. The others who are very good in bodily kinesthetic. Bodily kinesthetic is gym, gymnastics. Uh -huh. Dancing, it's when you can move your body to a rhythm or you can use your body to, you know, to on a variety of activities, you know. And according to your intent, people who are very good in bodily kinesthetic are people who learn by doing. They learn by doing, right? But people who are maybe like very good in, with special intelligence, they learn by seeing, okay, by seeing, right? Uh -huh. Then naturalistic, naturalistic intelligence. These are people who, who end up becoming farmers. They end up becoming, uh, they like taking care of animals. You know, they are the zookeepers, right? Uh -huh. Then uh, there is interpersonal intelligence. These are the marketers. These are people who are very good with people skills, social skills. Intrapersonal, people who know themselves very well. They are quiet. They like to be, they, to, like, they like to be in their space. They tend to be introverted, generally speaking. Uh, they tend to be, you know, they 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 know themselves very well. They can they they are, they can think about, uh, uh, you know, they in a in a in a world very very well, and uh, you know they can be quite quite smart. They can be quite smart, especially in understanding what happens within people. And then we have the existential skills. Oh, and here uh, these are people who love philosophy. They love questions about the meaning of life and all that. Okay. So the reason I am mentioning these nine, you know, domains of intelligence is for you to say, okay, maybe my child is not very good with logical mathematical, but maybe they're good in something else. Mm -hmm. If my parents had pushed me to uh, simply uh, be good in logical mathematics, I'm not very good in math myself, 
okay, I have to do statistics because in psychology, you have to do statistics because they are very, very important in terms of verifying data, okay? But still, it's not my strong point. Uh, still not my strong point, and that's okay. And that is okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, even I, uh, you know, I started lecturing when I was 29 years in a university, and I have grown up with ADHD, one of the learning disabilities that I've mentioned, the development disability that I've mentioned to you. I have it, okay? And there's nothing with that, okay? So it's very, very important that I say this, and I use myself as an example, so that you don't see it as a problem. I have I've had to train myself to sit down and concentrate, and even today is still a, a challenge, okay? So uh, it's, it's important to understand that. Okay, now, here I also want to mention that also intelligence is seen in three areas, in three areas. Have you seen people with a PhD, but they lack practical? You know, they, have, they don't have common sense? Huh? I know you know people like this. Oh, or people who uh, don't have a PhD, don't have a master's, but they're very, very smart. Mm -hmm. So that's very, that's, that, is, that is also understood in psychology. Yeah? It's a difference between academic intelligence and practical, or what you call street smart, or common sense. Okay? You can have a lawyer, <laughs> you know, a very big lawyer who cannot sustain a relationship. Huh? Because academic intelligence does not necessarily translate to practical intelligence. Uh, so you can have very good academic intelligence. And unfortunately, our education system emphasizes on academic intelligence a lot. But then these, the, the students who are coming out of this, they're very poor in uh, social skills, or what generally is called soft skills in companies. I don't like that word, soft skills. But anyway, it is used. Uh, these are just human skills, you know, the capacity to relate and be with people. Okay, to listen properly to other people, to understand, to be empathetic. They don't have these human skills. I don't know why they are called soft skills, for God's sake. They are very important human skills, uh, but they're very good academically. They get very good academically. So, and then there is creative intelligence, uh, which is they apply newfound skills to new situations. Okay, uh, so there are people who can, who can remember a lot of information academically, but they are not creative in the use of it. They are not creative in the use of it. So the reason I'm saying this, I will repeat that point, is sometimes your child can be good in certain areas that are not measured in academics. So think of your child like, let's say, a gazelle. Okay, so there is a gazelle here, there is a monkey here, there is a, there is a squirrel here, there is a, you know, and then you tell them, okay, I'm going to give you a test. Okay, I'm going to give you a test, all of you. And the test is what? Climb a tree. Okay, so the squirrel is very, very fast, it goes up very, very fast up the tree. The monkey follows at maybe the second, uh, uh, sec second speed. And then for what, what does the... I'm sure most of us, not, let me not say most of us, but a good number of us, Whatever we did in the university is not what we are doing today in our life. Huh? So to also to understand that and uh, to allow our children to so have those conversations. I always tell parents, start having the conversation about your child. What, what do you see yourself doing? And allow the child to explore. So by the time they are form three, form four, they kind of have settled. It will keep changing. I want to be an engineer. Tomorrow I want to be a doctor. The other day I want to be a, a you know, it will keep changing and that's okay. The most important thing is at least your child has a sense, has a sense of what they want to do. All right. Okay. Now, at this stage of at this at this stage of their development, uh, children are struggling with two psychological situations. They are trying either to be industrious, so they are trying to make mistakes. They are trying to learn new things, and they will make mistakes. Okay. And if they are allowed to make mistakes they will become more and more industrious. If not, if they are shouted down, they develop inferiority complex, okay? So that's what I mean. That's what I mean. At this stage of middle childhood, they are struggling with either industry or inferiority complex, okay? Can I try several things, okay? So you find you are, what, six year old, doing dishes without you telling them, and there is a knife there, or they are trying to cut something with a knife, and what do you do? How do, you, how do you respond to that? Do you react? 
Kwani wewe ni mjinga hata unaona hiyo kisu inaweza kukata? Aha. Inferiority complex to develop. Okay? Huh? So you explain, you explain that the dangers of having the knife nearby because then you, the child is exploring the world. The child is trying to be industrious. The child is trying to, uh, you know, uh, be competent. So they are industrious and they are busy, you know, and they are also trying to gain a sense of how they measure up compared with their friends, okay? And so I want you to see that last point. They are trying to get a sense of how they measure up compared with their friends. What does that mean as a parent? One of the most flawed ways of bringing up children is by telling them, why can't you be like so-and-so? It, it, it makes children develop a strong inferiority complex. Why can't you be like your cousin? Why can't you be like your sister who is quiet? You are telling maybe a child who is extroverted, why can't you be like your sister who is introverted? They are, they are very different people, first of all, okay? Uh, when you're telling your child, one child who is, has high logical mathematical intelligence, you know, to be, to be as great as a child who, has, who is maybe has high special intelligence, therefore they are good in art, or the opposite, okay? So, and the, the problem with this is, even some of us have internalized this in our adulthood. How many of us today compare maybe our spouse, our wives or husbands with someone else? Because we have internalized that from the very beginning. We were only told you're only as good as compared to someone else. You're not as good as who you were yesterday. I tell this to my first year students at the university when I'm preparing them to study skills. Don't focus on how other people are performing. Focus on how you were better than last semester, okay? And that is very, very essential. So when you internalize that, the problem is even when you get a car, you'd always see um, my friends have a better car than I am. You have internalized what you call the life script from the time you were very young, that I'm only as good. And that's the problem sometimes with, you know, Max with, uh, with number one and twos. I, I never ask my nieces and nephews their positions in class. I just ask them their grades. What, what is your grade? And what was your last grade? Okay, good improvement. I don't care about you, the, the positions. I don't want them to think that I'm only as good as the number that I was. I don't care about that really. And I want them to internalize that properly, okay? okay. All right, so uh, when they are successful, they get a sense of competence and confidence that I can face future challenges. But when they have feelings of inferiority, then they, have start, they start having self-doubt and they view themselves as less successful. So uh, their self-concept is more realistic uh, and it is influenced by peers, family members and other teachers and other messages. So when I was speaking to the other parents on early childhood, I was mentioning that self-concept develops when a child realizes that one important person values them. That is how it starts. So when the child knows my father loves me, my mother loves me and he or she says that I am good in this area. It is so, so important, okay? And that's why it's very important to distinguish between how you, how you love, that your love for your child is unconditional, and then there is discipline, and then there is grades, academic performance. Don't make the child feel that I'm only loved when my academic, uh, my academic is good, my academics are good. I'm only lovable when I am well-disciplined. No, you need even to, you need even to mention it to your child. You are my child. You are my son, no matter what. Okay, you're my daughter, no matter what. Even as I want you to improve your grades and to improve your discipline. Okay, now uh, there's a psychologist called Baja who says that for a child to grow properly, he, he or she needs, uh, the family needs to have met these five, five important functions. And number one is providing uh, food and water, clothing and shelter, very, very essential, by the way. Encouraging learning, children need to be, to hear from their parents that it should be encouraged to learn, uh, and developing uh, self worth and confidence. Uh, uh, so it is very very important developing self worth and confidence, uh, nurturing friendships with peers. So here a parent. So number num especially this point, dear parents, it's so very very important. Children who hear positive feedback from their parents about their body, about their dressing, about themselves, you know, they are more confident and they don't need to be told by other people that they are good and they're beautiful. So you as a father, notice you, your son, you know, notice your son who has dressed properly today. Notice, tell you, especially fathers, <laughs> tell, you, tell your daughter, 
tell your daughters because they need to hear that from a male figure. And here you can you can be of whatever political bent you have of whatever, uh, but that children need father figures in their lives is crystal clear in psychological literature and research. It's crystal clear. You 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 know I I. <laughs> Someone pointed out to me during uh, Father's Day how some particular single parents, single mothers, uh, took over Father's Day to say they are the fathers of their children. And uh, saying, okay, for political purposes, okay. But for psychological, scientific psychology, it has no basis, zero. Okay, so it's very, very important. So developing self-worth and confidence is very, very essential. Huh? And uh, children need to hear it. Children need to hear it. Okay, I need to move on faster than I'm doing. So nurturing friendships with peers, uh, help your son or daughter to select, sorry, help your son or daughter to select friends. Okay. And to, uh, you know, what kind of friends do you have? And uh, remember this, remember this. If you are moving, if you are moving, if you had only one child when they were around the ages of three and four, and your child didn't have uh, age mates, okay, they didn't have age mates to interact with around the age of three and four, they will have difficulties making and keeping friends, okay? They will have around the age of three or four is a very, very critical period of socialization of children. If they don't, even you can even remember your own stage where you are around the age of three and four. If your parents never really exposed you to playing with your age mates or having other siblings to play with at this age, you do have, you might find yourself having challenges with keeping and maintaining friendships, okay? So it's a very, very critical period, huh? Okay, so nurturing friends, what kind of friends are you and are you getting friends, okay? So providing harmony and stability is very, very essential for children that they come from a place where they can, you know, they see harmony. Now, stressors, what are the causes of stresses for uh, children? So uh, because they, so around this age, they spend less time with their parents and more with peers. So a good home environment is one which the child's physical, cognitive, emotional, and social needs are met. Now, there is something in psychology called adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences are so bad. I have seen some, one of you ask the question of bullying, okay? So let's talk about that in a bit, okay? Just briefly, right? Briefly. So here, adverse childhood experiences are traumatic events that can have negative lasting effects on health and well-being. What are these uh, adverse childhood experiences? One, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. By the way, this is very, very common. Huh? How, you know, girls are, more, girls are more likely to be abused by relatives. Huh? Household challenges, domestic violence, substance abuse by one of the parents or both of the parents or an older sibling, mental illness, of an older sibling or one of the parents or both of the parents, like depression or anxiety, parental separation or divorce, incarcerated parent, that means one parent or both parents are in prison. Neglect, emotional neglect, physical neglect. We call these ACEs, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, okay? Now look at this here. People with six of these ACEs can die 20 years earlier than those who have none. These are longitudinal studies that have been made to see that children who come from places where they have more than six ACEs die 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. One in eight of the population have more than four ACEs. All right. Now look at this at the very top of your screen, if you can see it properly. Huh? Uh, four or more ACEs, uh, four or more ACEs, children with four or more ACEs or adverse childhood experiences have three times the likelihood of that they would develop lung disease and adult smoking. See that? So every smoker you see, don't simply blame them, okay? 11 times more likely to use intravenous uh, drug, inject themselves. 14 times more likely to attempt suicide. This is across life, huh? across lifespan, across lifespan. Four times more likely that they began uh, intercourse by age 15 or earlier. 4.5 times more likely to develop depression and two times more likely that they will have liver disease, right? Now, adverse childhood experiences uh, uh, are the single greatest unaddressed public health facing our nation today. Mm -hmm. So 
as you can see here, ACEs results to disrupted neurodevelopment, that is brain development, socio-emotional cognitive development, adoption of high health risk behaviors, disease, disability, social problems, and even early death. Okay, so is your child seeing his mother getting beaten? Is your child seeing one of the parents very, very constantly drunk? Is your, do you, are, you, are you highly depressed or anxious? You cannot hide it from your children. They are very good uh, sponges of absorbing your emotional state, however, however, however much you try to hide it, okay? Uh, they get, have they gotten sexually abused? I usually tell parents after a certain age, your daughter should not be sitting on every uncle they see, on every cousin they see. Nope, that should not be the case. If your child says, I don't want to hang out or be with us a certain aunt or a certain cousin, don't push it, okay? So it's very, very important to understand this, okay? Um, I can see my time is um, being told to finish by what time? Ah, so my time is practically over. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, there's a lot of adverse, you know, there is a lot of, these are the, uh, these are the adverse childhood experiences. And uh, just here to mention, something that I've just mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, traumatic experiences during childhood are a root cause for many socio-emotional cognitive impairments leading to increased risk for unhealthy, self-destructive behaviors, violence, okay? So children from families where they experience any of those cases are they can be bullies, okay? So bullies can be those children who come from violent families, okay? They might have neurological problems, okay? So if your child has been aggressive from a very young age, they'll be aggressive, aggressive mostly throughout their life uh, unless they really get proper treatment. And it is usually there's something neurological about it, okay? Uh, that means they are not producing a certain hormone called serotonin, okay? So that could be a problem. So, but oftentimes they come from, you know, again, you know, very violent. The only way to deal with other people is to be violent also, okay? Uh, children, bullies tend to have very high, not low, as so many of us have been told, very high self-esteem. They think they are better than everybody else, okay? So constantly telling your children, oh, you're very, very special, okay? Okay, so that can be a bit of a challenge, okay? No boundaries. So that is very, very important to understand. Now, who are the children who are most bullied? Children from overprotective parents are the most bullied. Those children who don't know how to stand up for themselves because every single pain their parents rushed to solve for them. When the parents saw them fighting with their sibling, they are the ones who solved that problem for them. They never taught their children to stand up, to be assertive, to be assertive, okay? So it's not about the size of the body. It's about how confident the child is that makes them more susceptible to bullying. And of course, number three, the school itself has to find a way to, uh, to, to ensure that bullies are caught. It seems, it seems to be the best way to deal with bullies. First one is teaching a child to stand up for themselves properly, not to be violent, but to stand up for themselves. But number two is for the bullies in a school to know if I bully, I will be caught and I will be punished. Okay, that has to be the case. But if they know they can hide, then, and, and of course, number three is to ensure that you have a great relationship with your child. One of the greatest ways to know that your relationship with your child is not very good is your child lies to you constantly. That means they don't have a great relationship with you and they find it's better tell you a lie than the truth. Maybe because they'll be punished or that you not, you not understand them very well, okay? So, so you want to pay attention to that as far as you can, huh? So let me head because my time is uh, moving on fast. Huh? So uh, research estimate that one out of four girls and one out of 10 boys have been sexually abused with the median age for abuse between eight, eight or nine years. So we need to be careful about this. Huh? So the idea that we need to protect our girls more, you know, it's, it's true, we need to, we need to. Hmm? Not only because of uh, the higher levels of sexual abuse and especially sexual abuse happens within families. Very, very rarely do girls get abused by strangers. Huh? Uh, in, even when you rape or not, that usually sexual abuse, especially of children is intra-family. Yeah. Okay. So girls are more likely to be victims of incest, as I mentioned to you, while boys are more likely to be abused by someone outside the family. 
And sexual abuse can create feelings of self-blame, feeling dirty, betrayal, shame, and guilt, and which can result in depression, anxiety, problems with intimacy, and suicide. And it's so common. I went to one school. I don't want to mention the school because I don't, you know, because I will, and the school had asked me to speak to the form three girls. So I was speaking to them about sexual abuse. And so I told them to write to, you know, I gave them two questions to write on a piece of paper and to respond to me. They were 132 girls. So I, I told them, so I had explained to them what sexual abuse is and now to tell me whether they have been sexually abused. And so question one, have you ever been sexually abused? And two, have you ever told anybody? Out of the 132 girls, 60 of them had experienced sexual abuse at, at, by form three. And only four, four had told anybody. Okay. So a majority said this is for them they are writing on the So having a great relationship with your child can help to mitigate a lot. And so so high levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, affects a part of your brain called hippocampus, which helps you to remember stuff, okay? And therefore your memory, your mem the, the memory goes down, okay? And uh, children with high stress hormones tend to get, get sick very often. They will complain of abdominal pain. They will have unexplained diarrhea. They will have skin rashes all over the place. Uh, yeah, so it's very, very important to understand this. Huh? So that when you go to the hospital and you are, especially your daughter mostly, is com constantly complaining of abdominal pain and there is no. So it's possible that they, especially they, maybe you as a mother, you also highly, you maybe you are having high levels of stress or depression and your daughter is absorbing that, okay? However much you might be trying to hide it from them. So the brain, if we, when it's exposed to long periods of stress when they are young, it can be very, it can be hypersensitive. And this starts from the time you, uh, as a mother, you are pregnant. So let's say when you are pregnant, you had a huge conflict with your husband or you had whatever case, and that resulted to you having high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. Your child can, first of all, you might not have a great relationship with your child because it, the child always experiences a sense of rejection from you. And even how much you try to build a, that relationship, you can always might always experience a kind of a distance between you and your child. But secondly, your child can be very hypersensitive to stress. It gets very, very angry easily when, you know, easily challenged or cries at a moment's notice. You ask this child something and tears immediately, or they get angry, okay? Very, very easily, okay? So that means they're really hypersensitive to any kind of stress. And this sense of rejection, again, can lead to rejection. Rejection that children experience, leads them to be violent, not, not, only, not only among children, but also across people. So the more you experience rejection, the higher chances of being aggressive. So you hit me, I'm gonna hurt you, okay? So uh, this already mentioned to you that adverse childhood experiences have all these uh, uh, repercussions. I've already said this, so I don't want to repeat that. Okay, so I, I will finish with parenting styles because I've been told I have until 10.35, if I saw the comment properly, and uh, um, let me see if I saw the comment. I think it's 1035, I saw it. Okay, um, let me see if there's some questions here, then I can finish with the parenting part. If I go a few minutes I'll, uh, beyond, kindly allow me. Let me see the earliest question. That might have been there. Okay. So are the children, what are children getting to enable kids sleep more? The school needs to stop the morning work and allow the kids to report by 7 a.m. I stated the morning work is causing anxiety on my child and she wants to be in school before 6.30. Right. Uh, and you know what? what? I, I, I don't want to, I'm just going to give the inf this information out there. Huh? Is uh, But the parents and the school have to figure out a, a, a path forward. You know, one of them, especially with sleep, is uh, the sleep hormone. The sleep hormone is called melatonin. For us adults, we start producing our sleep hormone early, you know, as the night comes in around, let's say, even maybe for some people as early as eight, maybe even 10, depending on how much, on how much you are and how much especially you, you're not exposing yourself to light and technology. But teenagers, teenagers especially from adolescent age, if your child has maybe turned pu puberty has started, 
children tend to start to producing around 11. And so you find children, middle, ch middle children, they don't want to sleep early at all. But when you want them to get out of bed in the morning, around six, they don't sleep. It's a biological processing. Uh, melatonin is still very, very, uh, it's a lot, there's a lot of melatonin going around in the morning. Okay, so whereas your melatonin has reduced in the morning as an adult, you are teenager, especially, teenagers especially. Huh? That's when they want to sleep. That is when our schools want them to be in class by five. Anyway, um, so feel free to ask what, what caused a child to be a bully. Okay, I've explained that. How can kids deal, how can kids deal with bullies? Okay, I've mentioned that. And how can the school and the parents deal with this? Okay, so there's a lot of, so remember education is triarchic, means there's a parent, there is a child, and there is a school. So there has to be a cooperation between, you know, in the three. Um, so I'm not being, I don't want to be rude here, but you know, we want to see, does your child, uh, see, men, men needs to be kind of, there needs to be, you know, that, that's the importance of a father figure. A boy needs to be a, to have a certain level of a dominant male so that they know their place. Sometimes without that, that can result to a sense of bullying, huh? but not too much, not too much, okay? So you want to pay attention to that. Um, I can see the camera has come on, so I, that's a warning for me to finish. So let me speak about this parenting and then I, we can finish with that. If you have questions, you can always get in touch. Uh, so I just want to mention this uh, parents here. There's a matter parent, a matter parent. Uh, so a matter parent, <laughs> these, are not a, these are not a very good parents, by the way. So a matter parent is the one who will, who will tell their children, you know, I, I carried you for nine months and now you cannot come to visit me, okay? <laughs> so a matter parent will do something for their child only to use it in the future to control them, okay? Uh, you know, I gave you everything. Now you're giving me very poor marks, okay? Then there is a pal, those pal, parents who tend to think that my first role as a parent is to be a friend to my child. Wrong, wrong, okay? So they tend to be quite permissive, quite permissive. Number three is the police, drill sergeants. This is the classic African parent, the classic uh, Asian, Mexican parent. Huh? Uh, he's a drill sergeant, eh? obey, trust and obey, for there is no other way eh, to be happy. Huh? in this family, but to trust and obey, okay. So, and uh, when the children, of this, the children of these parents can be, can come across as very obedient and all that. But then when I go to the university where there are no rules to follow and all that, they can, they can turn to be something that you've never seen before because they were told to follow rules. And now there are no rules to follow. What do I do now, you know? Then there's a teacher counselor. It's not a good thing, you know? You might, it might look as a good thing from a face value, but. So a teacher counselor is the one who wants to take responsibility for every single mistake of their child. If the child is not uh, responding properly to him or her, she goes now to another seminar on parenting, you know, yeah? or reads another, another book on parenting. You know, okay, what am I doing wrong? You know, today I spoke to my child and she was very angry. Hey, let me read that book. Okay, no, 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 no. Again, that's a very good thing. You, there's no, you cannot really control the destiny of your child or how your, your child is gonna turn out. So the best parenting style is what you call athletic coach style of parenting. That means as a, as, as a parent, you prepare your child for the reality of life, but then you leave the child to face the reality of life. Just like a coach, the coach prepares the team, you know, everything is done, but when the game starts, the coach is not in the field uh -huh, and lets the child to play the game. I will not be able to finish because I can see uh, this, uh, the teachers are ready to continue the same, with, the, with, the, with the third part. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of questions that have come in, but I'm not able to respond. But from what um, from what I have seen from some of the comments, is maybe a good number of you have found this uh, session to be informative. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I it says I have tried to compress a lot of things in a very short span of time, and I am I am hopeful that you have found uh, this to be helpful. Uh, the I cannot add 10 minutes as one parent is suggesting because uh, I can see the, the teachers are ready unless they give me a go ahead. 
but I would like to add at this point, uh, you can always get in touch with me through the email that I have mentioned. And in case you want me to connect you with a counselor for you as an adult, you know, or for your child, uh, you can always let me know in the in my email, emails that I'll just share you with you here, or uh, you can always get my number from the school and text me, and then we can always talk. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, and over to you, Mali. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, our speaker. That was very good. I'm sure parents have gathered a lot on that. And I will not repeat any because we are really running under the blanket of time. Mr. Kamamwagi, thank you very much. Next, parents, kindly. I know you are tired of seated, but just we are almost winding up this. I want to come and call uh, Madam Elizabeth. There's something called open forum. The questions that you might have and all that. Now I want to call Madam Elizabeth to come and maybe have that. Then we continue and finish. Mr. Elizabeth, kindly come in front. Thank you, Sir Paul, for inviting me to, uh, to respond. Thank you, Sir Paul, for inviting me to 